Good afternoon, everybody. It is Wednesday, the 15th of February. You're here at Lunch and Learn. Today, as you've seen advertised, we have a guest lecturer, Debbie Elliott. She's there in Colorado. You can see her uh, place there. That's her home and the workshops they do, and she'll explain all that to you. You've read her background. Debbie's incredibly uh, involved in this kind of work. She's been doing neurofeedback for a very long time. They've been a part of this community. So instead of wasting time talking about her, she's going to give you her background and how she got into this work. And Debbie, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us. We're really looking forward to this. We really appreciate you being here today. Oh, I'm so grateful for this opportunity. Yes, this is a, a long love of mine. Uh, my dad and mom got me involved in biofeedback and neurofeedback in the early 70s when I was a kid. And I knew from the high chair on up that I was going to be a therapist. And so I've taken this work that my dad has done and still working my dad and now doing this uh, professionally um since i've been a kid really <laughs> so and what the neurofeedback has really changed over the years and so about um six years ago i became a psychedelic therapist with uh, ketamine and cannabis and just found extremely great results mixing neurofeedback with psychedelic therapy and that's what we're going to be talking about today so um, we do a variety of things. I see individual clients. We do um, workshops here weekend and week long intensives. We do nature quests of sticking people out in nature and then coming down for therapies and, and a variety of different things. And it's just really exciting work. So here we go. Catch the wave. Psychedelic therapy with neurofeedback. So here we, uh, so psychedelic assisted therapy or what we call PAP. Um, you know, we include a medicine, a, a psychedelic, to, to use it in psychotherapy. Um, there are many different ways of using this. So the two common ways of doing psychedelic therapy is um, the deeper dive psychedelic therapy, where we actually take the medicine and have them do deep dives where they will go into hallucinations. On ketamine, it's almost like you feel a computer reboot of the nervous system and, you know, just feeling more relaxed and more embodied without that default mode network on top of us. There is also psycho, psycholytic therapy, and this is the low-dose psychedelic states where we do psychotherapy. So we kind of get that ego state to soften a little bit. So we have the subconscious material for psychotherapy to come out. And it's amazing how deep I can go with that. And I do mostly psychoanalytic therapy, although people do like the psychedelic therapy too. So psychedelic assisted therapy can help a variety of different diagnoses from depression, PTSD, anxiety and OCD, end of life and grief, mind body connections, pain, autoimmune, life transitions and consciousness exploration and addiction, which is something I don't like to work with. So, you know, we're not the first people to uh, play around with psychedelics. Psycho uh, the psychedelics have been around with the uh, ancient and, and indigenous cultures for a long time. South America, they use ayahuasca with the medicine man. Native American the churches use peyote and St. Pedro. Um, they call the head one the road man. And Siberia and Africa, they use magic mushrooms a lot. And Hindu and Buddhism, they use soma, uh, a mixture of different uh, herbs and things. And then in ancient Greece, they used a wheat-based drink with ergot, which is LSD. And they would use this to kind of enhance their philosophies for mind expansions and, and exploring consciousness and healing. So in the second waves of psychedelics happened in the 50s and 60s, where Albert Hoffman discovered LSD. Um, the Harvard Psychedelic Club, so that we have John Lilly and Tom Leary and Ram Das and even Andrew Wheel all were playing with psychedelics and kind of got in trouble. You know, Timothy Leary became the trickster and Ram Das became the spiritual man and healer and John Lilly uh, um, did a lot with ketamine in the uh, iso isolation chambers. Um, and Andrew Real kind of got into the functional medicine piece, which I feel like they all fit. Uh, the, 
countercultures and festivals got really popular with psychedelics. So we have Woodstock and different things where it got out of control a little bit. So they started to work on harm reduction and how to help um, people so that they don't get into bad states or into the wrong setting with psychedelics. Then we started to work with psychotherapy with it. Stan Groff was a big person in that and, and worked with ketamine and LSD and other things before he went to his breathing stuff. And it got really popular to have a, a, a sitter and uh, create the right set and setting. And then we had the crash of the psychedelics. So the Reagan era, and the just say no. So in 1970s, they took away all the funding and made it illegal for us to do research. But there was still some underground therapies and research that continued. There were some spiritual exemptions, like the Native American church could still do their peyote ceremonies. Um, the, the other churches could work with ayahuasca. So there were still some options around and then, you know, one of the great things about this just say no time period is that we started to work with non-ordinary states in other ways, like Stan Groff really became well known for his whole allotropic breath work that takes you to psychedelic states of really looking at dream work, consciousness exploration, meditation and mindfulness, spiritual practice, light and sound, wilderness therapy, Reiki, body work, and ecstatic dance all became into this place where we could play with it in non-ordinary states. And then we came to the psychedelic societies and the Renaissance wave. And so MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelics and Rick Doblin started uh, a, an association looking at psychedelics. Rick Strassman uh, got some grant funding to do some DMT research in New Mexico. The Hefner Research Institute with David Nichols and the Beckley Foundation and John Hopkins with, with uh, Dr. Griffith, who is just outstanding. And then um, James Fadiman did this underground microdosing research, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Then I'm so excited for the future wave of psychedelic therapy. You know, we're going to make all of this legal therapeutic use here really shortly, especially in Colorado is going to be one of the cutting um, states for this. You know, I'm excited about uh, having more of an apothecary of choices to play with different psychedelics with this. And not only that, when we're on psychedelics, we're more open to um, states of uh, entrainment. So we're looking at light and sound and infrared light and get big results, bigger results with that. So what are the combinations to help with that? You know, we, I really want to see this as helping human evolution and compassion. You know, most psychedelics, when you take them, you feel that we are all connected, that we are all one and honoring these traditions that have been passed down to us. You know, psychedelics also bring this worth is wisdom. And I'm so hoping that we can take better care of our mother earth and know, know that Gaia is a living organism. And then a big one, because in Colorado, they just, uh, um, allowed personal use of plant medicines, we're gonna see a big problem with uh, harm. And so really learning harm reduction. And uh, there's going to be in, in Oregon, they're using non-psychology trained sitters, which I'm a little bit nervous of, but how do we train our society to help in these ways. There's going to be some abuse because most of the psychedelics are serotonin based and we can give them serotonin syndrome if they are on antidepressants. And that's going to be a big thing. We'll see. So how to keep people safe. So legalities. Always consult your own attorney before becoming a psychedelic therapist. This is a high litigious realm. My my office and house and retreat center are uh, an FDA approved site. So you know, there's a lot that goes into it. Right now, ketamine is currently the only legal psych psychedelic and it's off label for that. Um, we also have cannabis in some states that you can do. I really recommend people, if they're interested in psychedelic, becoming a psychedelic healer, they start with cannabis. It's one of the easier plant medicines to play with in a psychedelic way. 
So MDMA is going to get FDA approval here. Um, they were saying in 2022, but COVID uh, prevented that. So now they're saying 2024. And psilocybin mushrooms, you know, it's already legal in Oregon for the the home user. And I think this year they're going to make it legal therapeutically. And Colorado just decriminalized plant medicines, um, which includes mushrooms, DMT, ayahuasca, mescaline, and ibogaine. They did not bring in peyote because we're preserving the peyote um, for personal use, although I'm not allowed to touch it yet. And so they just uh, two weeks ago put together a board with the Department of Regulatory Agency, and they're going to have the new regulations by May of 2024 of what we can do. So are all psychedelics the same? Yes, they, 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 they put us into this extraordinary experience where there's an introspection, where there's a, you know, it creates more brain receptivity, which we're gonna see here. And, uh, and it permanently alters the client. And so it's, it's really exciting. I've never seen psychotherapy go so far. And they're not all the same because they, they trigger different sets of neurotransmitters and have their own flavors and landscapes and languages and uni, you know durations. So they all have their pros and their cons. We have um, the practical differences are the neurotransmitters. So the classic psychedelics like LSD, psilocybin, DMT, and ayahuasca, mescaline, and ibogaine are mostly serotonin receptors. But you know, when we talk about neurotransmitters or you know, what's the master switch and then who talks to who, and so dopamine gets thrown in there, um, acetylcholine gets thrown in there, norepinephrine gets thrown in there, depending on the, the different mixes of different things. Um, ketamine is a disassociative anesthetic drug, uh, you know, so, so sub anesthetic dose would be anywhere from 50 milligrams to 150 milligrams in an intermuscular injection. And it works on a, like a dream state. So they're in a lucid dream where we can work with their, their dreams. So ketamine works on the glutamate receptors and the NMDA receptors and the AMPA and they, they work on GABA and serotonin and the mTOR, and it really increases the growth hormone of brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So it really enhances the brain. And there's a, there's a feedback loop between the glutamate and the serotonin with, with ketamine. So here's a, a picture of, you know, kind of being with master switches and what's going on with your brain. It's all very complicated of what goes to what and what what does everything. So poor Homer is a little confused. We have um, the difference of time. So when we look at therapies, this can get really expensive because psychedelics can take a lot of time. Like with cannabis, it can last anywhere from two to 10 hours, depending on how you take it. DMT can last 10 minutes when inhaled or 30 minutes when it's an IV. Ayahuasca can last for three to seven hours. Ketamine takes 45 minutes to two hours, depending on what kind of uh, medicine you're taking. Psilocybin is three to six, mescaline six to 12, MDMA five to eight, LSD for six to 15 hours, and Ibogaine takes two days. So these are big, big things when we're looking at that. And that's why I kind of like uh, ketamine. When I look at all of them, I feel like ketamine really gives the insight and really helps the brain and is it the right time for therapy? You know, in the MDMA studies, they have the people spend the night and they're doing seven hours of therapy with them. So the cannabis wave. So, you know, this is the people's medicine. That we, most states have it legalized either medically or recreationally at this point. Um, and people have been self-medicating using marijuana for pain, insomnia, anxiety, and mood, um, helping with a, a drug relapse prevention, seizures, gastrointestinal issues, it helps in lowering inflammation, especially with CBD, and then which can help fight cancer, and it lowers blood pressure. I really like this because I feel it's the training wheel of all psychedelics to help therapists learn how to do it. And, you know, it's a mainstream plant medicine. 
So here is a client I did probably six years ago who was uh, quitting her marketing uh, job to start a yoga studio and she was completely stressed as you can see here with all that beta and high beta and we did a, a, a conscious what I call a conscious cannabis circle where we have her smoke in a ritualistic way and then put provocative music on while she wears um, eye mask and goes on an inner travel and afterwards, she felt so inspired about her new business that she was creating. And we took a look at her brain and she had lost all that high beta. So it was a really useful session for her. Here's another client, a college student, and the, the parents were very upset. She was starting to fail out of school and not going to school. She had a bunch of traumas and rapes and, and uh, home life issues. And we were diagnosing her with pandas when we did this. And she kept telling her parents, but cannabis helps me. And, uh, you know, they're like, no, you can't. Nope, 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 nope. So I asked the parents, can we take a look at her brain when, when she's in her normal state and then send her out to smoke a little bit and have her come back and look at her brain? And we can see this huge improvement that it just quiet the nervous system. And so we got this, you know, with cognitive efficiency, we went from a three up to a seven. So that's a big difference. We can see with focus, that our focus even improved. With mood, mood improved. She started to be nicer to herself. So, you know, Cannabis can be a really helpful medicine here, and it can also be abused. All of these medicines can be abused too. So here is psilocybin or magic mushrooms, and this slide is not in the right place, but um, with this one, we're looking at the WAVI system and looking at coherence. And so um, a friend of mine did a, a 14 subject uh, microdose and macrodose of psilocybin, and we can see here in this coherence that the frontal lobes go off. So we always see in, in, in research that, oh, the brain overconnects, but not necessarily. And I think it's really interesting that on most psychedelics, we get the frontal lobes to turn off. And I wonder what's going on with that. Is that the default mode network of getting off that executive functioning so we can go to deeper connections and insights? Um, is it just turning off the executive function? And you can see the one on the left is the macro dose. And that one lit up the visual centers where on the macro dose of psilocybin, you will have visions and see things differently. So you can see that starting to express itself. Up, oh, here's a, here's a relaxation one for cannabis. So we can see relaxation state about the same. Um, but going back to psilocybin, uh, John Hopkins University is really the leading university over there. Um, and Dr. Griffith uh, is leading that. Um, and, and again, amazing man. And so in 2019, he released this study on depression. Uh, so at the start of the, the subject scored 23 on the grid Hamilton depression scale. And so 23 is the upper moderate depression. After one week, 67% showed a 50% or more reduction in depression, which is huge. After four weeks, 71 showed a 50% reduction. And at the end, 54 of the participants considered themselves in full remission. And the average score on the Grid Hamilton Depression Rating Scale became an eight when it was 23 before. Then Dr. Griffith uh, started uh, to look at cancer patients and giving them psilocybin to help them with um, understanding their diagnosis and helping with the grief. So he, he, he found 51 subjects with life-threatening diagnoses with depression and, anxi and anxiety about dying, and they gave them mushrooms. And uh, they all reported that they had better quality of life, more meaning about life, that they were able to accept the death process and the cycles of life, and they had optimism. They were able to connect with their loved ones so much more. And these effects lasted for more than six months. 
they lasted longer, you know, but they tested after six months. And then 80% of the participants said that their well being and life satisfaction were moderately or greatly improved. So, one of the sad stories of this, Dr. Griffith, this past summer has been given um, the diagnosis, uh, a fatal diagnosis of cancer. And he's really looking at his his journey in this, having helped uh, hundreds of people on this journey. Now he's doing it, and uh, and he talks about it now. So if you ever get a chance to see him speak, he's just outstanding. So the MDMA wave. So we have Maps is doing these ongoing clinical trials that started probably what eight years ago. Um, and so it's in phase three right now, and it got interrupted because of COVID, unfortunately. But and, and Boulder is one of the places that they do do the clinical trials. So I have a bunch of friends that are the doctors over there, and they are getting just amazing results. So they do three MDMA sessions with two therapists. And, um, and after that, 67% no longer even qualify for PTSD diagnosis. And 88% experience a clinical meaningful reduction in symptoms. So MAPS is seeking FDA approval and they are thinking it's now gonna happen in 23 or 24. They thought this year was going to be the year. And they are right now training licensed therapists to become certified in, with the MAPS protocol. So if you're going to do MDMA therapy, you have to follow the MAPS protocol to a T and the expected client cost is 15,000 to about 400,000. And it most likely will not be covered by insurance. So I'm pretty sad about this. It feels like even though MAPS is a, a nonprofit that they're definitely profiting from this and it's a little too expensive for most people. So how do we keep this for every, every, pe every person? So what is, you know, so here's kind of the, the process for just the therapy side, you know, again, they have to go through all this medical evaluation before they even get to the therapist and they're doing a bunch of testing. So for each of the three MD, D MDMA sessions, we have one prep session. So we look at finding what their intentions is, are what they want to work on and everything like that. And then they have one MDMA psychotherapy session that the therapists are there for eight hours and then the client spends the night. Um, and then they have a one check-in session to write at the day after, and then they do an integration session where they go into the details and how to pick the jewels out of what they experienced on the psychedelics and how to put that into our real life. Like I so strongly believe integration is our most powerful session. So you need two therapists for this. One needs to be male, one needs to be female, one needs to be licensed. So when we're looking at therapy hours, it's 70 plus therapy hours. So that is a huge cost. So what they found with MDMA is that it's not effective at the lower dose, that you really need the bigger dose. So uh, 120 milligrams to 160 milligrams is what they're offering. They used to offer 80. I'm not sure if they're still doing that, but um, they're not getting the therapeutic benefits with MDMA with the, the low dose therapies. So LSD, microdosing and self-reporting. So James Fadiman was a, um, an LSD therapist before the just say no time. And so when, it, when he could no longer do research, he put it out on the internet and then just offered, you know, hey, here's a microdosing thing. Take one tenth of a normal dose of LSD and do that every third day. And then let me know what you feel. And he gave this, uh, the, the PANS uh, checklist, which is this uh, positive and negative assessment. Um, and then he found that most people, their improvements was in, you know, they, they improved their negative mood, especially with depression. It increased positive moods. It increased energy. Their work effectiveness went up and it improved their health habits. 
And then they started to notice that it was affecting the bottom or the, the body. So the, the, you know, it was helping migraine headaches. It was helping premenstrual syndrome, traumatic brain injury, shingles, and Parkinson's. That when you're on a psychedelic with Parkinson's, the shakes go away. So here's a, some research that I did with a friend of mine of just looking at uh, what happens when somebody is on a microdose of LSD. So you can see that uh, frontal alpha that she had, she had some trauma going on. And then when she went into the LSD experience, it goes to high betas. And most of the medicines, uh, the psychedelics do that, go to the higher betas. Um, and so just to look at the LSD brain. So here's the looking at coherence again of that turning off of the, the frontal lobes. So you can see before the baseline, she had that alpha turned off, that being comfortable. And then on the LSD in the beta and high beta, we turned off the frontal lobes. So then the ketamine wave. So ketamine assisted psychotherapy in 2000, Berman, reported that a single dose of ketamine at 0.5 milligrams to kilogram induces a rapid and robust antidepressant effect in several depressed clients. There was a 50% reduction in depression with 71 to 79 response rate after 24 hours. So that is huge. And then ketamine rapidly reduces suicide ideation within hours. One suicide ideation study reported that 81% of the patients were free after 24 hours. So we're starting to see this being used in our emergency centers. So ketamine um, is approved as an anesthetic in 1970. They used this in the Vietnam War, so it often gets called the the the, the soldiers anesthetic. Um, they so if you were out on the field and got blown up or got injured on the field, they would inject people with ketamine and then get them to the the medic. And they found in that population that got injected, they had less PTSD than the ones that didn't get the ketamine. So then it started to be looked at for PTSD and depression. So right now, ketamine is an off-label use for depression treatment. Um, and in March 2019, the FDA approved a Johnson & Johnson's ketamine version called Spravato for depression treatment, um, which is, allows some reimbursement from insurances, which I'm so excited that we need to get this out to everybody who wants to try this. Um, that study is so flawed. I am amazed that the FDA gave them the approval, though. And so we'll, we can really improve on that. And the, Spra the, the Spravato is a really low dose version. So the, and the nice thing about ketamine is a relatively short duration for therapy. So it's about 45 minutes to two hours, which is more reasonable, I think, for um, being in a therapy place with a person. So here's my very first ketamine client. So this client was a college student who was suffering from PTSD and her psychiatrist told her she was bipolar and they kept raising all her meds on lithium and lamictal and she, you know, it blew out her thyroid. She gained all this weight. She was wanting to drop out of school. She became suicidal. I called her mom and said, you know, uh, let's pull her out of school. Let's, let's really, we got to work on the suicidation. And there's this new medication that's being used right now that I would like to try with her. Also got her to a doctor, a functional medicine doctor to help her thyroid. But on our first ketamine session, about 45 minutes in on it, she screams out, I forgive you. And I asked, who, who did you forgive? And she said the person's name that abused her, which she could never say the name before. And she says, I forgive you. I forgive you. You were injured and you just acted towards me in your injured way. And it was a turning place in her life. And her, she, she has an amazing life now, two kids and super happy, moved to Israel and is following her Jewish tradition, which also came out on these ketamine experiences too, this connection with God. 
And so I was like, wow, how can in the first session when I've been working on this for like three quarters of a year trying to help this PTSD in one session, she forgives her abuser. I was just amazed. But then I looked at this map and I'm like, oh my gosh, look at that phase lag. Like it improved a head injured look in her body just one day. So I started to look up, you know, what happens. Oh, it's not in the right place. What happens with the brain? Let's go to that one. So, uh, you know, ketamine is a brain enhancer. And I think that's why I really love it because it's so good with neurofeedback that way. It works on the glutamate and the GABA neurotransmitters. And ketamine increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor more than anything, including exercise. And when you encourage ketamine and exercise, it's amazing how easy it is to let go of old habits and bring in new behaviors. And so I'm doing a lot of cognitive behavioral stuff and that integration of creating what they want to bring to their life. It uh, releases that vascular endothelial growth factor, just helping the, the vascular system with neuroplasticity. You know, and we when we look at antidepressants, they decrease brain-derived neurotropic factor. So we're not making that difference. We're just numbing the symptoms out. So I really see ketamine as this way to truly heal the, the deeper issue versus just suppress the symptoms. And ketamine restores long-term potentials. So the presynaptic mechanisms that help with memory extinction of fear and PTSD populations. And it creates strong synaptic connections and an engagement of the dendritic spine. So it really is helping the brain. And so I really love that. Okay, so here is um, a, a, a normal and ketamine state. Uh, this is a, one of my most difficult clients I've ever seen in my life. Uh, he, uh, he was doing home ketamine sessions during COVID and this, the, my psychiatrist friend wanted me to watch him while he did home sessions. And so I met him for the first time and, the, and he was a very pleasant guy with a very, very sweet hearted, uh, but he told me that he liked the taste of human flesh. So I call up the psychiatrist, what the heck you're giving him a psychedelic when he is schizoaffective? And in fact, he did trigger the schizophrenia discriminant in the NX link database. He's not a full blown schizophrenic. His mom is upset that I see him as schizoaffective, but he definitely has that. He does not want to be in this human body and feels like he is being tortured. And so we can see, um, so I, I stopped, I had him stop the home trainings and we only will supervise him. And that's the only way I do kind of meet with people. They, they don't get to do it on their own at home that they have to be in the, the office to do it. And, but at first I got to know him for about four months before I let him go back on ketamine. And he was upset about that. So here we go with the normal state with the cognitive efficiency, you know, at one, and everything just highlighted, he is so uncomfortable, he cannot even stand himself. And about a month and a uh, half later with a once a week ketamine sessions, and this ketamine cognitive efficiency was a day after a ketamine session. You can see the big difference that he's now at that functioning at five with such a major reduction of symptoms. And so, you know, he was non-functioning when I met him, lived in his parents' house in the basement. And now we got him. He has a job at one my mom's favorite store in Boulder, Peppercorn. And uh, he's, I wouldn't say he's thriving, but at least he's engaged in life, even though he still does not want to be human. So here's kind of uh, some some more on him, like his focus uh, improved, his mood improved, but the relaxation level that I, I don't want to be in this body continued. So then I started to look at how about we do low dose ketamine and add neurofeedback. And I got such great results. So work, you know, it works really well with over arousal clients. So anybody that has the anxiety, OCD, PTSD, overwhelm, 
bipolar when they're not their manic phase. It is amazing what I can what they can do with their brains. So we have them come in. We give them either you know 100 to 200 milligrams of lozenge or four nasal sprays, four to eight nasal sprays. And so they're still able to walk, talk, and, and do things with me. I usually have 19 Z-score on, but sometimes I'll do single electrode too and do more specific trainings. And they definitely are able to train much easier and they're able to hold it for about four days longer. And then we're making the training time go down by about half to change their brains. So the sessions take about an hour and a half to two hours. You know, anytime anybody is on a psychedelic, whether it's cannabis or ketamine here, they cannot drive. So we have to get a driver and we're even stringent. It can't be an Uber driver that we don't know. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we make sure that they get that care. Um, yeah, and that the, the, this brain-derived neurotrophic factor lasts for four days. And so we love to get them in in that four days after they do either a big dose or a low dose of ketamine, get them in in that next four days to really enhance their treatment and their training of neurofeedback. So here is um, one of my depression clients. Uh, she, she couldn't get out of bed. Her brother committed suicide by standing in front of a train and she couldn't feel meaning in her life. She wasn't able to take care of her school aged children. And so uh, um, we asked, do we, you know, do you want to try this uh, cutting edge therapy of ketamine? And she was very open to it. So again, this is one of her first sessions that we did. And we I usually start with that low dose so people can get to know the medicine first. And so you can see at the beginning, you know, just that delta and theta that she cannot move, that frontal alpha that goes to the left, that negative thinking, and then the beta on the cingulate gyrus looking like an uh, OCD, and then also with the beta two and the gamma all on that left side, just really uncomfortable. She just came in crying. And then, you know, halfway through the session, she basically could clean it up except for that delta. It was just amazing to see that. We did, I think, maybe six sessions, and she reported herself as completely um, healed and became a healer herself after this, before she worked at a gun store. So here is a, an alcohol abuse client that had PTSD. He told me that he was no longer an abuser. So I saw him because uh, I do not like to work with addicts. And so we can see with his pre-ketamine, just that classic look of, of PTSD and alcohol abuse, the high beta with the OCD look down the cingulate, the beta two, the gamma, and then we have the delta and theta in the frontal lobe. And he had some major eyesight issues. So the, you know, the occipital, uh, issue is uh, just uh, knocked out with the coherence and phase. And I think this was like on our third training that he was able to totally let go of that high beta, go into meditation states and release this. And he loved it. He said it was one of the most helpful therapies he ever did. And then he went out on the street and not only did he get his prescription of ketamine, he found uh, mega doses of ketamine on the street. So I can't, so we told the psychiatrist, we tried to get him into drug rehab and he disappeared, unfortunately. So that's one of the side effects and the abuse potential that happens. We have to watch for out for these people. It is not uh, physically addictive, but it's definitely emotionally addictive. It brings you to bliss. So we saw with this uh, one client, that he really desired to stay in that euphoria land and didn't want to be in his life. So he brought back the, the, the addiction. Um, but the acute side effects. So when we have somebody, if anybody gets motion sickness, they most likely will have a little nausea with uh, ketamine. Ketamine being a disassociative, it knocks off that proprioception and uh, just can cause that nausea. So we do medicate for nausea in that population and sometimes with the, um, the with other medications. We also want to look at uh, blood pressure. 
So blood pressure will probably go up about uh, 50 points at the beginning when they're coming on just because it's so exciting and it's out of the ordinary. So we really want to make sure blood pressure is in normal levels. And uh, if it's not, we can medicate this with ease. And we look at, you know, how active is the person is we want to make sure that their blood vessels are more elastic, you know, for people that with obesity or older veins, we really want the blood pressure to be down. So when you're on the medicine, you can feel dizziness. You know, that's part of the ketamine experience. You are in a lucid dream. So if you try to fight the dream process, you'll feel dizzy and it will can feel uncomfortable. Most people report that as feeling good. And then you can also get a headache just because it's so extraordinary. So we watch out for those and can can help people with that. So I if people Debbie, just are, to give you a, a heads up, you're at 12 minutes to the hour. Okay, great. I think we'll get through this. So um, heavy and prolonged daily use can cause bladder issues, liver toxicity, brain toxicity, and neurocognitive impairment. It's not a drug you want to be using all the time. You want to use it uh, sparingly and then really work on things in a straight state. So here is a a PTSD and uh, head trauma. So she was on a, in a head-on crash and just had total nightmares about always being run over. And you can just see just the overactivation of the brain and this top part. And, uh, you know, a little bit of the head injury with some of the phase issues on the bottom. And through ketamine, we were able to totally quiet down the brain and again, help with some of the head injury issues. So I'm getting such great results with ketamine and head injury. And again, this is one that we did training in the office. She was hooked up to 19 channel Z score during her low dose ketamine. So if you are interested in this, you need to experience it for yourself first. And so we offer that. We, we started years ago offering group ketamine sessions to therapists and MDs to give them the experience to, to look at that. And so here we can um, individualize or you can join one of our weekend retreats like we're planning on doing a, a retreat this summer and also this fall on neurofeedback and ketamine including uh, the, the low dose neurofeedback. And we're also bringing in EEG hyperscanning where we're looking at the EEG with multiple persons and how we, how we look as one. And that is really curious. We have one data point now on ayahuasca and it's amazing how similar everybody's brain went and how connected they went when we looked at this EEG hyperscanning with them. So I'm really excited to bring that in. We're also bringing in neuro meditation with Jeff Taran stuff, and he he often comes and joins me for these workshops. So if you're interested, please let us know, and we can create whatever experience that you would like if it is legal. So I want to thank you for your interest in psychedelic therapies and so much gratitude for New Mind and, you know, Robert and, and Richard for this opportunity. And here's another picture of my land with a deer. This is my ancestor altar. I have these meditation stations on my land that are just beautiful. And just opening this up to questions now. All right. We'll, we'll uh, take a moment to get folks unmuted. Um... One of the questions, I, and I'll send you a slide, there's a company also that is selling uh, mushroom supplements, but they're not psilocybin, but they're helpful for sleep. And, and then they say, you know, like a relaxing experience. I wondered if you've heard about those. You know, so Stamos is most well known for psilocybin, and he always uh, likes to add lion's mane with uh, psilocybin. And so that there are these just different mushrooms that they are putting together. Yeah, it helps with serotonin. So it helps, you know, with sleep. So it really is going to be an amazing um, antidepressant, and even when it's not at that psychedelic level. And so we're going to see a lot of these supplements coming up. 
Great. Okay. I, I think we have already unmuted. So I'm going to be quiet and let others ask questions, Deb. <laughs> Real quick, Debbie, could I ask you, I don't know if you can make this recommendation, but I have clients that have sleep issues and they get benefits from CBD with low dosage THC in gummies. One of the companies yeah. is Industrial Hemp out in Colorado. I don't know if you can name a company, but to trust somebody that might have that quality instead of some aberration. Yeah, what I love to do with those people is instead of shooting in the dark, in fact, I think my girlfriend is on this uh, webinar right now. Her name is Roz Dauber. And if you send me an email, I'll get you connected with her. And she has a, a master's degree in pharmacology with cannabis and can really help figure that out. I think what they're finding for sleep, if I'm correct, is that it's uh, um, one to four, that CBD is four times more to that THC, and you really need that THC for the CBD to work. Thank you. Yeah. I'll do it. Yeah. But to have that guidance with somebody that knows and can, then can follow you and give you suggestions of different brands and you know really hone in, I, I think it's a great service. I'll say thank you. Uh, we had a question come in on the chat panel. Somebody's asking, they're wondering if you can speak to ketamine infusions for pain. Uh, they yeah. have clients who get infusions. Um, they're in higher amounts for five days, uh, 670 Ooh. milligrams per yeah. infusion. Can you speak to yeah. any benefits of therapy during post-infusion state or any research with that? Yeah, I think it is amazing that they're doing that versus giving them pain meds. And it's not a high dose, you know, so that 650 is used over that 24 hour period. And so they're just slowly putting in uh, ketamine and they're, they started to use it for osteopathic surgeries with children and they got such great responses. And it does take away some of the trauma of the the surgery and releases the pain and puts them into a bliss state and allows healing to happen faster. They usually do it for three to five days and um, they just get a, a low drip during the, I think only during the day because it's hard to sleep on it, but they might give a low, low, low dose when they're asleep too. And they're getting great results with that. Unfortunately, a lot of the IV places do not do the therapy part. And a lot of our research so far in ketamine is with the IV. We are going to see dramatic train, uh, changes when we really see what the therapy piece can do with this. Because it's not the medicine. It is what you do with the medicine and the life you create from your, 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 your dreams on the medicine. But it's really good for pain. Thank you, Debbie. Yeah, I appreciate that. This is Ursula Klitsch, and I've worked in uh, chronic pain and complex medical for over 20 years and in ketamine infusions. I've been a part of that uh, for the last 10, but uh, more so on the sidelines. Any bit of, quote, therapy was mostly around helping people tolerate it if they went into maybe a so-called bad trip, bad travel experience, or helping people navigate. Um, my experience is that the patients are quite sedated throughout and maybe really going in and out of their state. And then they're quite sleepy afterwards. But in the last couple of years, I've thought more about kind of getting in, nudging in the therapeutic piece, like right after that kind of the end of yes, that state so important. that integration straight integration time is so mm -hmm. important so would you say like during or um if they can stay awake or the post yeah, time when you're, in, yeah when you're recovering from surgery i think sleep is the best thing although you know checking in on their states you know it's rare that we will get uh, a bad trip on ketamine i had a, a doctor friend of mine derek may who did the the bad trip research over at john hopkins and he reported, I think it was like close to 80% of the people that had a bad trip on psilocybin remarked that their bad trip was the, the top three changing experiences in their lifetime. 
So mm -hmm. bad trips are not necessarily bad, uh, right, but they, right. they are opening a big blockage. Definitely but, an opening. I see a lot of fear related type things opening up for people. If you have that control issue, psychedelics are hard and you can on, you know, so that OCD population, I really, uh, you know, I'm hitting them with uh, therapeutic touch and meditation so that I keep their default mode from knocking the ketamine experience out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that, that work afterwards, I would so hope that uh, the hospitals would do that. I have talked with maybe three kids that have had the surgeries and we're wondering, what, did they have cognitive issues because they were in there so long when actually they were improving? So there is a fear whenever we go into these these altered states. It can be scary. Yet with a you know with a, a proper guide, most people don't feel that. Yes, thank you. Any any tips for keeping them awake? I don't know if you aging? want to keep them awake. Yeah, I think their dreams are the healing part. And so I would allow them to go into whatever I might, you know, for me, I would put on some beautiful, relaxing music and let them go into that lucid dreaming with ketamine it would be yeah. what I, I would recommend yeah. and not really go into the therapy part. They're recovering from surgery if that's what they're there for. Or if it's just a, a chronic pain, that's what you're talking about. I think, right, more. right. Chronic pain chronic infusions. Pain. Yeah. yeah. We do the All music those, and that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But all those concepts of the mind can make up the pain and how do we let the you know those grooves of that chronic pain of the brain start diminishing and bring out pleasure and bliss and feeling good in the body really anchoring that good feeling in their body sure sure i do have a, a question if somebody else doesn't doesn't have on uh, about a, a very unique situation that happened where a person stopped breathing during ketamine, but they, the hospital team, because we had to call a code, determined that it was voluntary, like a voluntary stopping yeah. breathing that wouldn't yeah. normally yeah. be, no, you know. There is a population that can have some respiratory issues. It's not, you know, it's not a brain derived thing, but it is a, usually a chosen thing. But we have to be careful because <laughs> it depends how far out they are in that they might not realizing that they're you know they're epoxic and uh, i have you know come over and shaken people to breathe <laughs> yeah we had but a full code team like, what are you doing <laughs> <laughs> but it does also when you hold your breath you can also go to more subtle states and i feel like that's what they're doing more that it mm -hmm. is a, a sort of mm -hmm. meditation Thank you. Yeah. All right. Is there any other quick last questions since we're at the top of the hour? What I'm going to do then, Debbie, is I'm going to say thank you so much. In the words of Dana Carvey, uh, <laughs> that was like <laughs> all out, way, way cool, <laughs> most excellent. And um, Great. I'm sure we're going to get a lot of questions. And I know you and I talked about coming back and doing some follow up webinars with us. So we'll be in touch about that. But thank you so much Great. for today. I would love to tell you how I do it and get more into my protocol. Um, so would well, love to do that. Let's you and I set a date. Let's you and I will. I'll email you uh, within the next day or two and uh, we'll set a date for the next one and we'll go with whatever works well for you then. That sounds great. Thanks, Rob. All right. Well, thank you.